Before the accession of Charles I in 1625, the separation between the Church of England and the Puritans, which had been slowly widening for half a century, had become so serious as to be a menace to the peaceful stability of the kingdom. Charles began his reign with repressive measures against the Puritan influences. His use of the Star Chamber and similar tribunals is an important subject of study in connection with the preliminary steps on both sides which led at last to the Great Civil War. The Parliament passed the Petition of Right, the second English Magna Carta, and Charles ratified it. By this act, the King was bound to raise no more monies without consent of Parliament, not to imprison anyone contrary to law, not to billet the military in private houses, and to subject none to martial law. From 1629 to 1640, Charles governed without a Parliament, replenishing his exchequer by various extraordinary means. The jurisdiction of the ancient Concilium Regis Ordinarium, or Court of Star Chamber, continued to be exercised more or less frequently, notwithstanding the various statutes enacted to repress it, and that it neither was supported by the act erecting a new court in the third year of Henry VII, nor originated at that time. The records show the Star Chamber to have taken cognizance both of civil suits and of offences throughout the time of the Tudors, but precedents of usurped power cannot establish a legal authority in defiance of the acknowledged law. It appears that the lawyers did not admit any jurisdiction in the council, except so far as the statute of Henry VII was supposed to have given it. The Chancellor, who was the standing president of the Court of Star Chamber, would always find pretenses to elude the existing statutes and justify the usurpation of this tribunal. The civil jurisdiction claimed and exerted by the Star Chamber was only in particular cases, as disputes between alien merchants and Englishmen, questions of prize or unlawful detention of ships, and in general, such as now belong to the Court of Admiralty. Some testamentary matters in order to prevent appeals to Rome, which might have been brought from the ecclesiastical courts. Suits between corporations, for the corruption of sheriffs and juries, furnished an apology for the irregular but necessary interference of a controlling authority. The statutes, however, restraining the council's jurisdiction and the strong prepossession of the people as to the sacredness of freehold rights made the Star Chamber cautious of determining questions of inheritance, which they commonly remitted to the judges, and from the early part of Elizabeth's reign they took a direct cognizance of any civil suits, less frequently than before, partly from the increased business of the Court of Chancery and the Admiralty Court, which took away much wherein they had been wont to meddle partly from their own occupation as a court of criminal judicature, which became more conspicuous as the other went into disuse. This criminal jurisdiction is that which rendered the Star Chamber so potent and so odious an auxiliary of a despotic administration. The offences principally cognizable in this court were forgery, perjury, riot, maintenance, fraud, libel and conspiracy. But besides these, every misdemeanor came within the proper scope of its inquiry, those especially of public importance and for which the law, as then understood, had provided no sufficient punishment. Thus corruption, breach of trust and malfeasance in public affairs, attempts to commit felony, seem to have been reckoned not indictable at common law, and came, in consequence, under the cognizance of the Star Chamber. But the greater certainty of conviction and the greater severity of punishment rendered it incomparably more formidable than the ordinary benches of justice. The mode of process was sometimes of a summary nature, the accused person being privately examined and his examination read in court, if he was thought to have confessed sufficient to deserve sentence, it was immediately awarded without any formal trial or written process. The party was brought before the court by writ, and having given bond with sureties not to depart without leave, was to put in his answer upon oath. Witnesses were examined upon interrogatories and their depositions read in court. It was held competent for the court to adjudge any punishment short of death, Fine and imprisonment were, of course, the most usual. The pillory, whipping, branding and cutting off the ears grew into use by degrees. In the reigns of the two Henrys, the fines were not so ruinous as they came to be, which we may ascribe to the number of bishops who sat in the court and inclined to mercy. The reproach, therefore, of arbitrary and illegal jurisdiction does not wholly fall on the government of Charles. They found themselves in possession of this almost unlimited authority, but doubtless, as far as the history of proceedings in the Star Chamber are recorded, they seem much more numerous and violent in the present reign than in the two preceding. They consist principally of misdemeanours, rather of an aggravated nature, such as disturbances of the public peace, 
assaults accompanied with a good deal of violence, conspiracies, and libels. The necessity, however, for such a paramount court to restrain the excesses of powerful men no longer existed, since it can hardly be doubted that the common administration of the law was sufficient to give redress in the time of Charles I, though we certainly do find several instances of violence and outrage by men of a superior station in life, which speak unfavourably for the state of manners in the kingdom. But the object of drawing so large a number of criminal cases into the Star Chamber seems to have been twofold. First, to inure men's minds to an authority more immediately connected with the crown than the ordinary courts of law, and less tied down to any rules of pleading or evidence. Secondly, to eke out a scanty revenue by penalties and forfeitures, absolutely regardless of the provision of the Great Charter, that no man shall be immersed even to the full extent of his means, the councillors of the Star Chamber inflicted such fines as no court of justice, even in the present reduced value of money, would think of imposing. But adjudged by such a tribunal as the Star Chamber, where those who inflicted the punishment reaped the gain and sat like famished birds of prey with keen eyes and bended talons, eager to supply for a moment by some wretch's ruin the craving emptiness of the exchequer, this scheme of enormous penalties became more dangerous and subversive of justice, though not more odious, than corporal punishment. It is evident that the strong interest of the court in these fines must not only have had a tendency to aggravate the punishment, but to induce sentences of condemnation on inadequate proof. From all that remains of proceedings in the Star Chamber, they seem to have been very frequently as iniquitous as they were severe. In many celebrated instances, the accused party suffered less on the score of any imputed offence than for having provoked the malice of a powerful adversary, or for notorious dissatisfaction with the existing government. Thus Williams, Bishop of Lincoln, once Lord Keeper the favourite of King James, the possessor for a season of the power that was turned against him, experienced the rancorous and ungrateful malignity of Lord, who, having been brought forward by Williams into the favour of the court, not only supplanted by his intrigues and incensed the king's mind against his benefactor, but harassed his retirement by repeated persecutions. It will sufficiently illustrate the spirit of these times to mention that the sole offence imputed to the Bishop of Lincoln in the last information against him in the Star Chamber was that he had received certain letters from one Osbaldiston, master of Westminster School, wherein some contemptuous nickname was used to denote Lord. It did not appear that Williams had ever divulged these letters, but it was held that the concealment of a libelous letter was a high misdemeanour. Williams was therefore a judge to pay five thousand pounds to the king and three thousand to the archbishop, to be imprisoned during pleasure, and to make a submission. Osbaldiston to pay a still heavier fine, to be deprived of all his benefices, to be imprisoned and make submission, and moreover to stand in the pillory before his school in Dean's Yard, with his ears nailed to it. This man had the good fortune to conceal himself, but the Bishop of Lincoln, refusing to make the required apology, lay about three years in the tower, till released at the beginning of the long parliament. Leighton, a Scots divine, having published an angry libel against the hierarchy, was sentenced to be publicly whipped at Westminster and set in the pillory, to have one side of his nose slit, one ear cut off, and one side of his cheek branded with a hot iron, to have the whole of this repeated the next week at Cheapside, and to suffer perpetual imprisonment in the fleet. Lilburn, for dispersing pamphlets against the bishops, was whipped from the fleet prison to Westminster, there set in the pillory, and treated afterward with great cruelty. Prynne, a lawyer of uncommon erudition and a zealous Puritan, had printed a bulky volume called Histriomastics, full of invectives against the theatre, which he sustained by a profusion of learning. In the course of this he adverted to the appearance of courtesans on the Roman stage, and, by a satirical reference in his index, seemed to range all female actors in the class. The Queen, unfortunately, six weeks after the publication of Prynne's book, had performed a part in a mask at court, this passage was accordingly dragged to light by the malice of Peter Halin, a chaplain of Lord, on whom the Archbishop devolved the burden of reading this heavy volume in order to detect its offences. Halin, a bigoted enemy of everything puritanical and not scrupulous as to veracity, may be suspected of having aggravated, if not misrepresented, the tendency of a book much more tiresome than seditious. Prynne, however, was already obnoxious and the Star Chamber adjudged him to stand twice in the pillory, to be branded in the forehead, to lose both his ears, to pay a fine of five thousand pounds, and to suffer perpetual imprisonment. 
The dogged Puritan employed the leisure of a jail in writing a fresh libel against the hierarchy. For this, with two other delinquents of the same class, Burton a divine and Bastwick a physician, he stood again at the bar of that terrible tribunal. Their demeanor was what the court deemed intolerably contumacious, arising in fact from the despair of men who knew that no humiliation would procure them mercy. Prynne lost the remainder of his ears in the pillory, and the punishment was inflicted on them all with extreme and designed cruelty, which they endured, as martyrs always endure suffering, so heroically as to excite a deep impression of sympathy and resentment in the assembled multitude. They were sentenced to perpetual confinement in distant prisons, but their departure from London and their reception on the road were marked by signal expressions of popular regard, and their friends resorting to them even in Launceston, Chester and Carnarvon castles, whither they were sent, an order of council was made to transport them to the Isles of the Channel. It was the very first act of the Long Parliament to restore these victims of tyranny to their families.